So good evening, everybody. My name is Scott Lytle. I'm the chapter chairperson for the IEEE EMC Society here in Southeastern Michigan. And I thank you all for joining us this evening. I'd also um, like to thank our sponsor this evening, Nixperia. John Hargenrader um, contacted Candace and, and made all the arrangements for the meeting. And he also arranged for some nice door prizes. So we have three $50 door prizes that we're going to giveaway uh, at the conclusion of the presentation. Um, the, the method we're gonna use this time is a random number generator and then that will go against the roster and you must be present to win. So if we call the first name, they're not there, it'll roll to the second name and we'll go until we have three winners. Our uh, speakers tonight, we have two of them. Mm -hmm. um, the first one is Dr. Andreas Hardock. Andreas is the application marketing manager for ESD Nexperia. Received his diploma at Julius Max Milanus, which I'm sure I said wrong, University Wurzburg, and his doctoral degree from Hamburg University of Technology in 2010 and 2015, respectively. In his research, he worked in the field of signal processing on filters and couplers based on vias. Since 2015, Andreas has been working in the automotive industry for BHTC and Continental, where he was involved with ESD and EMC topics. In 2020, Andreas joined Nixperia with the main focus on ESD and automotive and high-speed applications. Dr. Hardock is the executive committee for the IEEE German EMC Society. Our other speaker tonight is Mr. Lucas Dromer? Yes, that's right, Drummer. <laughs> Drummer. Lucas is the product manager for protection and filtering at Nixperia. He received his bachelor degree from German Nor the North, North Academy. <laughs> North Academy as company sponsored student of NXP semiconductors. Since 2018, Lucas works for Nexperia as a product manager for ESD protection and filtering devices with a focus on automotive in vehicle networks such as CAN FD, infotainment, and open alliance Ethernet. So, welcome, gentlemen, this evening. And our first uh, presenter will be Andreas. And, Andreas, uh, it's over to you now. Oh, thanks, Scott. But the, the first presenter will be Lucas. <laughs> okay, so, oh, I, Lucas, I, I, I stand corrected. <laughs> All right. No problem. So Lucas will take this, the first part and I will take the, the second part. Perfect. Yeah. Scott, so thanks for the red carpet. And uh, again, <laughs> thanks everyone for, the, for joining here. So um, yeah, it's a, yeah, a special occasion for us to, to guide you here for the, this topic of ESD and automotive. Uh, and as we uh, or as you discussed in the, the beginning, so you're in the industry for for some time and uh, you, you saw a lot, um, but I hope, or I'm rather sure that uh, we have some new uh, insights we can share here. And um, yeah, so my name again is Lucas Trümmer. And um, then you have some pictures here. I cannot share my camera today um, uh, because of the, uh, the weak internet connection. I, have at the moment. So if the uh, audio breaks uh, or something, then uh, please just shout and use this reaction button at the bottom uh, or just type in the chat. And um, yeah, I think uh, Scott Andreas, we can have this like an open discussion. So uh, we will guide you through the slides, but if you have questions, just uh, ask them right away uh, or if you have comments. Um, so we keep this more interactive. Okay, but to give you a glimpse of the presentation, so um, we will start again with yeah, not the basics of ESD protection, but um, just have the same part of uh, point of departure, so to speak, um, and guide you through this trend we see and, and why we think that discrete ESD protection uh, becomes more and more of a uh, uh, yeah, focus topic. And um, then uh, we will move on with the uh, latest application trends where we focus uh, more on the open alliance Ethernet and the uh, high speed links, and really um, share some latest results of our studies and analysis uh, in, the, in the EMC field. And uh, we'll also provide some little extra for you. So, not only uh, the uh, gift cards, <laughs> but also uh, 
uh, a simulation extra v prime for you. Okay, so ESD uh, is the abbre abbreviation for electrostatic discharge. It's a triboelectric effect that uh, can occur basically, yeah, anytime and everywhere. And um, yeah, this is a, yeah, a problem because it causes micro level damage. We will show this more in a second. Um, but yeah, more in the industry field. So in the assembly set, we want to have a low uh, humidity to avoid corrosion. But uh, this also has the effect that the risk of uh, this triboelectric effect and in consequence ESD is uh, way higher. So we, we have this, this paradox, let's say, and um, the, the, the challenge is that ESD that is really causing this micro level damage uh, inside the gate oxides or the, the, the layers um, of, uh, of an ICs or semiconductors in general. Um, and it's, hard, it's really hard to detect. Um, and we will show in a second why this becomes more an issue with the, the latest uh, developments and latest modules in the, in the automotive field, but also for other applications, of course. When we discuss ESD, we always distinguish between two perspectives, uh, and that's the device level and the system level perspective. So the device level itself describes the ESD robustness uh, of the device, so of the product. So this could mean um, the IC could be a, a MOSFET um, or the diode itself. And here we have different standards. Um, so I think you're familiar with the human body model. Um, we have some older models, let's say, uh, like the machine model and charge device model. Um, but again, those standards uh, and those KV levels a device can achieve, they only describe the robustness for the device. And that's yeah, mostly important for the assembly process. Um, but when we discuss ESD on an application level, on a module, then we call this the system level. And here we really have to focus on the whole PCB, on the whole module, and uh, consider all components. And there, um, you may know the uh, IEC 61000 or 2 standard, or if, uh, yeah, more for automotive, the ISO uh, 10605 test, where we really try to, to simulate the uh, system level behavior. And uh, this gives us more an indication on the, um, on the system robustness and hence more yeah, the reliability of a module. And here we see really some uh, yeah, EMC threads uh, that will that will come with uh, with the latest uh, trends in, in, in data reads and buses. Okay, so this is the uh, waveform uh, of the uh, IC pulse. Um, so here we have yeah, an ESD gun um, that uh, generates um, those pulses up to thirty kilovolts. And in this um, test setup, we have a, a 150 picofarad capacitor that's charged from um, a charging switch uh, from 50 to 100 milliohms. And then this capacitor is discharged uh, through a, a, a resistor of uh, 330 ohms um, uh, with a discharge switch. And by this, we uh, generate those different levels uh, you can see in the table. Um, but more important, we see that, um, so we have a very fast rise time of 0.721 nanosecond, where we then reach the peak current. Um, and then the, um, the rest of the pulse, it goes up to, to 80 nanoseconds. And there we see this, like say shoulder shape, or so we call it the shoulder. And this contains the vast majority of energy. So this is more like a surge pulse that goes into the, the device. And if you will look up the uh, charge device model and the human body model, so the poses separately, you will see that this is actually like a superposition of both tests and really represents the, the system and gives a good indication um, on the system level robustness. Okay. So then one more comment. So you can perform the, uh, this uh, test uh, in two settings. Um, so in the, the contact discharge and the air discharge, 
And here the, the key point is the reproducibility of those tests. And basically if you, yeah, as you can imagine, so contact discharge means that the, uh, that the gun is really contacting uh, the pin. And uh, as such, we avoid external factors like air humidity, the, the, the gap uh, we have here and, and other effects. Um, so with the contact discharge, we have much better uh, reproducibility. Um, and uh, yeah, as for the air discharge, humidity, etc., cetera, plays, plays a role. And here again, you see the, the test setup that's, um, um, that is representing this, this model. For the ISO 10605 norm, so you will have the same setup, but there you also have variations in the combination of capacitance and uh, of the resistors. So it's um, the, the setting of the uh, IEC 61000 um, 4 2 where we have 150 picofarads and 330 ohms. It's same for this isonorm, but there we also go up in capacitance. So we have settings of 330 picofarads and 30 ohms, and also combination with two kilo ohms. Um, but as you can imagine, so if you then increase the resistance, um, the, the, the waveform is also less critical for the device. Okay, so, but for the following, um, we will focus on the device level, so to really assess the ESD robustness on the, on the module. Um, and in the beginning, I told that it causes this micro level damage. And here, on, if you uh, take this waveform and see which yeah, part of the waveform causes which damage, we see that this um, yeah, super sharp peak, um, this is really the, the ESD strikes that damages the gate oxide, and this is where we um, have a very weak uh, detectability. Um, and yeah, often those failures are not visible that they really can become a quality issue. And then in the shoulder waveform, which uh, yeah, contains the vast majority of the energy, so there we really have this electrical overstretch, stress, high surge, and there it really burns the metal layers. But still in both cases, so if you have a high surge failure, then you will see that the, the diode is really burning or the IC. But in those um, small voltage surge ranges, we have this internal uh, failure of the gate oxide. And there you, you can only know. use an X-ray or uh, uh, disruptive physical analysis to detect this. And this is unlikely to happen in the application field. So this is really tricky and becomes more uh, an issue as the ICs become more sensitive. Um, so this is here a uh, yeah, little busy slide, but what it says basically is that um, the, the design area that is needed in order to achieve two kilovolt human body model um, and the ratio of the function area of the IC, um, this is really out of balance. Um, if, if we chink, shrink the um, uh, gate thickness, of the IC. And so this, this balance is unhealthy just to keep uh, two kilovolts uh, of human body level. So it makes much more sense uh, for IC manufacturers um, to, or also for, uh, for OEMs or electrical manufacturer designs um, to uh, exclude the function of ESD protection and add discrete ESD protection because those products are dedicated to um, increase the, the system level robustness significantly. Um, for maybe low speed uh, applications like CAN, in this case here, you might think, okay, if, if I have a standalone transceiver, this is less critical, they are robust, and that's right. But this trend of sensitivity is much more critical when we go to high speed. So there we're talking about five, 10, 15 gigabits per second, and there it really becomes an issue. But still for the low speed, so in this case, that was uh, 10 Mbit per second, we used a CAN uh, bus. And um, they, on the left-hand side on the table, you see different transceivers from yeah, a broad range of, of manufacturers. And you see that the device level robustness ranges from eight to 10, 12 kilovolts human body level. So the, again, that's sufficient for the assembly. But in the application case, so if we have um, yeah, spark occurring, and maybe during maintenance, 
um, to bring up one example, um, it's likely that it's above 15 or even more kilovolts. And then this would be not sufficient anymore. But if we add a discrete ESD protection device, um, it will uh, uh, clamp the vast majority to ground in front of the phi and works like a, a current divider in that case. And in this uh, scenario, we increase the system level robustness up to 30 kilovolts. And this is again, as I said, the maximum which uh, yeah, an ESD can, gun can generate. And um, uh, here you have a much better um, reliability of your system. Um, again, so the selection criterion first is the device versus the system level, but when choosing the ESD protection device itself, there's much more we, um, yeah, we as engineers have to consider. And if you have a PCB design, you will first think, okay, what is the, the, the space I have available? You will ask yourself, um, do I need a single line device or do we need multi-channel uh, protection? Uh, what is the, the footprint I have available? Um, do I need a leaded or a leadless package? If I have an automotive with a leadless package, do, does my assembly need um, side vertical flanks to allow automatic optical inspection? So those are, let's say, the external factors uh, you, you must consider. And then we also have the electrical performance. And there we have, uh, yeah, a bunch of uh, parameters starting with the working voltage and more importantly the breakdown voltage so where the um, ESD protection activates so to speak the clamping voltage that is a really important uh, parameter I will um, present in more depth on the next slides the dynamic resistance and also the uh, parasitic capacitance so there are a lot of factors we should consider um, but to focus on the clamping voltage again, so the clamping voltage is that the, the voltage that um, still goes into the fine after the uh, ESD diode went into breakdown, so it activated. And here you see a graph of a yeah, typical Zener behavior. So you, you again, uh, with both polarities, so this is a bidirectional device in a positive negative direction. And here you see that we have the working uh, standoff voltage we have the breakdown voltage and then it, it triggers and yeah, it starts to clamp and then it has this yeah, steady or, or yeah, normal clamping behavior. And in general, that's okay. It also depends on the, the voltage uh, class or power range we're talking about. But if we talk or focus on, uh, on EMC again, and EMC becomes more critical for high speed, then this classic approach is not sufficient anymore. And that's where uh, next period, it developed uh, the TREOS technology. We launched this in uh, yeah, six years ago. And here we have a so-called snapback typology. So you have still um, the, the working voltage, but then we uh, defined a trigger voltage where the diode goes into breakdown, but it snaps back to a certain holding voltage, and then it starts to clamp. And what you can see now is that by this um, uh, silicon control rectifier, we uh, actively push down the clamping voltage and by that we improve the robustness because now the, the stress that still goes into the phi is way less. So, um, and that's something uh, you should really consider when improving um, your, your design. One real life example in this case is uh, given here. So that's uh, from the uh, open lines Ethernet testing. And here you see a, um, a comparison of a silicon uh, diode versus the varistor. And the varistor you see, so this is like yeah, normal Zeno behavior breaks down and then slowly clamping. Um, but on the right hand side, if you, if you see this uh, um, ESD clamp graph, then you can see that it becomes tricky. So the uh, straight yellow and orange line, those are the limits. Um, so uh, class one and class two for a human body model. And you see because of this slow uh, triggering or a breakdown behavior of the varistor, it really violates those limits in case of, of open alliance. Um, but with the snapback um, and silicon um, typology, 
you can see that we actively pull down and uh, um, have enough safety margins for those limits. And that becomes more critical when we talk about uh, higher reliability buses and uh, um, those uh, trends we see, especially in automotive. Okay, so that's um, enough theory from, from, from that point. So let's uh, talk a bit about the applications in different buses. Um, you know, just quick look on the, the classics like Lin Ken, and then we will move on quickly with Ethernet and uh, focus a lot then on the uh, high speed uh, buses. So Lin Ken is uh, yeah, well established, so to speak. <laughs> and um, so those are really the, the, the low speed buses. Uh, so Lin with uh, 10 kilobit per second and Can FD. Yeah, maybe we, we can also already talk about KNXL. So going up to 10 Mbit per second. Um, so this is rather low speed in the car. And uh, here we have uh, yeah, requirements uh, or common requirements for the, uh, the parasitic capacitance uh, from uh, uh, yeah, up to 100 picofarads for LIN. And then for CAN, we talk about 3.5 up to 30 uh, picofarads and for CANFD, a maximum of 10 picofarads. And um, so this is just an indication um, in, in order to pass those, those tests. And then for the um, different uh, board nets, you have so 12 volt and 24 volt uh, board net. You have different uh, test settings in the ISO 16750, uh, where you must uh, comply um, like the over voltage test or, or load down test, and they uh, give a certain, uh, let's say, corridor for those tires to pass. And um, again, so we have here some schematics on the, the right side, and there you see that we always recommend, like in the theory, to really position the diode behind the connector to have the, the best uh, protecting behavior. But we also show some more measurement results um, later, or Andreas will show them. Okay, then come to Ethernet. So here, Ethernet is establishing more and more, um, also driven by, um, yeah, by the open lines and also, of course, IEEE. Um, and Ethernet is needed to really establish those, this vision um, that is in the automotive area to have this, uh, let's say, all IP. Uh, car and really um, steer the modules we have in the car in the solar architecture um, with, with software and there Ethernet is really the key enabler uh, in order to achieve this. And um, yeah, so the open lines was formed to standardize uh, the, the Ethernet usage in the car and there in the field of EMC, there's an, yeah, an old specification and this is quite different uh, compared to the classic Ethernet we know from, from industrial area, but also uh, other automotive designs. And the main difference is that in the classic Ethernet, the EC protection was often placed between the commode termination and the phi. And uh, this is tricky because here we really need to match the internal protecting behavior of the phi with the EC protection because of this uh, clamping behavior I showed before. So that can really become an issue that if the uh, phi is clamping too early, it will take, uh, of course, the, the energy of the ESD strike, and then we will still see damage. Um, so this is, this is an issue. And it also, again, uh, it's not the best position to, to protect your system. So that's why in the open lines, the ESD protection as we also recommended earlier, should be positioned right at the connector to uh, decouple the uh, protecting behavior of the phi from the discrete EC protection. But in this case, we are also uh, protecting the passive components, components and also the, the commode termination. Um, and this, um, this brings way better protecting behavior. Enough theory, let's go into Real life. So here you see uh, three PCBs uh, from Nexperia um, and, and three different scenarios. So on the 
Um, bottom you have the connector, then we have the command termination and different positions to place the ESD diodes. And at the top, you see the phi. Left side is without ESC protection. In the middle is open and lines. So the ESC protection at the connector or also um, yeah, representing like Lin can uh, the, the, the position at the connector and at the right ESD protection uh, between the phi and the command termination. And uh, we measured or we shot uh, with an ESD gun and uh, measured then with an EMI scan the uh, current density on the PCB. And that's how we get this nice colorful picture here. Uh, so red uh, means a high current density on the PCB and then such high electrical stress and blue color. It's like a, like a heat map um, or heat camera, uh, but on, on current level. And what you see here is that if we don't use any protection, you really see that the current uh, is, um, is going through the whole PCB through the traces into the fire. And here it can cause us this micro level damage, damaging the gate oxide. And that's something we don't want to have. Um, if we position the ESC protection uh, between the phi and the common more terminations on the right side, um, then it already looks better at the phi. Um, but we still see that, uh, of course, the common mode choke is taking a lot of the ESC ports, but still through the traces, there's a lot of stress. Um, but if we position the protection device at the connector, it works uh, as predicted as a current divider. And here at the phi, you see really zero or little electrical stress. Um, and that's, that's how, how we improve the system of buses for the design. Okay, but the open lines and also the other high speed links, they have more uh, requirements for ESD protection. And here Andreas will now guide you through the specialties. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Lucas, for, for the first part. So I will um, yeah, take the second part and we will start here with this open alliance. So um, continue with, with Ethernet, open alliance Ethernet, and uh, also some specials um, for the ESD protection device. And the spe special is that here we uh, have, uh, yeah, for the first time, a really dedicated spec specification for the ESD protection itself. Uh, so earlier on, on for, for Ken and Lynn, there is typically um, yeah, a specification or an isonorm for the total link for the entire link. But here we have a really dedicated spec for the ESD protection device. And uh, the one uh, special part is that there really uh, is a recommendation to place the, the ESD protection at the, at the connector here. And you all know, all the EMC guys know, uh, all filters and, and uh, for sure ESD protection is a, is a kind of filter <laughs> here. So you need to you need to place it uh, so at, at, as close as, as possible to the source, and the source is here, the, let's say the connector where when you shoot the ESD poles in, and this is the connector. So as 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 closer it's placed to the connector, the better your 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 if, uh, yeah your protection will be. Um, so, but <clears throat> this is not uh, for sure not 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 the only one. Uh, yeah, um, thing. Uh, some really more specials are, yeah, there are some general requirements on the ESD protection device. And the first one is the, is it has to be diff, diff, bi directional, uh, but, uh, or, and it should survive 15 kV and not only uh, 15 kV, but a thousand discharges. And it's not allowed to 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 be damaged after thousands of charges, 15 kV. So it's really a tough requirement, let's say. Um, so um, uh, further, um, more that it, it has to have uh, kind of high trigger voltage. One, it was already shown in the example to which in this comparison, Lucas. Uh, uh, shown uh, with um, yeah silicon versus varistor, and there you have seen this uh, really high trigger voltage of the ESD protection device. So it's kind of very unusual in in the automotive uh, to have this kind uh, the high trigger, and this is mainly due to this unwanted clamping test. We will come later uh, come to in, in in a few seconds. 
So those are some general requirements, uh, let's say. Yeah, and um, in addition, there are some additional tests. You see here, yeah, some four, four tests, additional tests needs to be performed with the ESD protection device only. And those you can kind of uh, cluster in, in three uh, groups. The first group is containing two tests. So those are both referring to the signal integrity. Um, so then we have, an, uh, let's say, ESD, special ESD test where an ESD discharge current is measured, which is, which is uh, flowing into the fire during an ESD event. And the uh, last group is the, this unwanted claiming. This is an immunity test, uh, yeah, DPI you, you might know. So this is very similar to this DPI test. Okay, let's start with the, um, yeah. Signal integrity. Oh, I missed one. I see here. But let's start with this damage from ESD. So here uh, we um, measure the scattering parameter. So we have the differential system here. Either is a differential system. So we uh, for sure then measure differential uh, scattering parameters. So um, return loss and uh, insertion loss and common mode rejection. And the, the tricky part of this test here is that you measure, yeah, scattering parameters, then you shoot 8 kV ESD poles, 10 times plus, 10 times uh, minus, and then you measure scattering parameters again. So, and the target is you are not allowed to deviate at all. And uh, so um, those are real results here we're showing, which uh, are done by FTZ. You also might know this test center in Germany in, in, uh, and so, uh, so you're not allowed to deviate here, and uh, also not for the common mode rejection, which is giving you some how an, an idea how much of the common uh, of the differential mode is converted to the common mode. So uh, also here, where yeah, very low values, but still here you're not allowed. You're really not allowed to deviate, and um, yeah, this is yeah some some special we have not uh, do not have this for for other um, uh, automotive buses but uh, as we said yeah open lines might here might here some special test set so um then the, the, the third one is the ESD discharge current measurement. And here, Lucas uh, teased it already shortly. So we have here the following setup. Uh, we have the, the, let's say the entire well, yeah, system PCB here uh, and um, including the transceiver or IC itself, the common mode choke, uh, common mode termination and the ESD protection device here. So, and we shoot with the SD can on this, on this, on this bus, and um, we replace the IC by a um, very simply uh, resistor network, is simply two, two ohm here. Uh, and we measure the current which is flowing through this two ohm network. And this current are shown, shown here for two. Uh, ESD pulses, six, six kV and, and 15 kV. So, and so we have here some limits representing the, the, the human body model, 2 kV and 4 kV, and we need to stay below this, below those limits. Uh, so for 6 kV, it's uh, must have, for 15 kV, it's uh, optional, but even with 15 oh, for this, uh, yeah, let's say 15 kV high is the pose. Uh, so uh, having this snapback behavior, as Lucas explained earlier, uh, yeah, you can also pass pass this test here. Yeah. And the last one is this unwanted clamping. It's unwanted unwanted clamping. This uh, very very similar to to DPI. So you know, you uh, apply an RF noise on on your network. And uh, yeah, you are not allowed to absorb too much energy. And here you have three classes. Uh, yeah, the class three, the, the uh, strongest one is, uh, yeah, the, the um, power uh, of your RF noise is 39 dBm. So this is the maximum. And uh, still here, you're not allowed to 
lamp to absorb this energy. And this is a requirement for the trigger voltage, as we said previously. So you really have to uh, need to have a trigger voltage uh, above 100 volt because the amplitudes, which what you have here, um, the voltage amplitudes, which may occur is uh, yeah, above, uh, far above, uh, yeah. 50, 60 ohm. So you really, with a little margin, you came into the region of a 100 ohm, and that's why Open Alliance decided to have this high trigger here. Okay, this was the let's say classics plus the Open Alliance. So Open Alliance um, became became very popular popular in the last years. So due to this changes and trends in the automotive industry coming into, from this flat car architecture into the zonal architecture. And we see here open alliances very, oh yeah, kind of forming all the specifications for ethernet and ethernet is, is very, very strong. Uh, almost all, all tier ones, uh, yeah, yeah, implementing those open alliance links in their systems. It's, uh, yeah, yeah for, for ADAS infotainment and uh, body control units. You, you, we, we find it almost everywhere, <laughs> let's say. Okay, Ethernet, and then let's go to real, yeah, to, to more to more high speed and um, high speed links in the automotive. You will find for sure in uh, in infotainment and other systems, and those are uh, yeah uh, full of um, let's say cameras and, and display already now. Uh, and it will uh, more and more increase in the in the next years. And uh, so um, there are several, uh, let's say, um, links or bus um, protocols which are available right now for for video links uh, connection. Those are GMSL, FPD link, and RPX. You you might know them. And but also there, um, or oh, let's say. Those are very appropriate systems, so they are not uh, compatible between each other, and that's why the ASA Alliance so is 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 forming right now and discussing how to create a common standard, common protocol, uh, just to have uh, yeah uh, really uh, yeah open standard also here for video links, and uh, so but here yeah the ASA Alliance started uh, and uh, we will see in the next uh, years or next time how it will develop. So those video links are yeah, very popular already now and uh, as we said will become uh, even more important since uh, this trends of infotainment uh, will increase and but also the classics which you know from mobile the USB and HDMI are uh, are pushing or are stepping into this automotive market and all of them video links and those USB and HDMI links are um, yeah very very high speed links and uh, so those high speed links for sure are very sensitive or can be very sensitive as Lucas showed with the um, with the yeah size of um, of ICs and and uh, complexity of ICs and uh, yeah less space for internal ESD protection so the demand of external ESD protection will increase here for sure also EMC is a very very yeah uh, important topic here uh, for those um for those links because we have the switching applications here we have not, not much not much current but but we have very really high frequencies going in the you know that in, in yeah in the gigahertz uh, range and we need to take care about them and but uh, we also have the let's say the signal integrity we where uh, which we need to care about and so we also as an experience need to care about because uh, also the ESD protection device when you put it in into your link into your high speed link it will impact the 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 signal integrity and so you need to to care about when um, yeah selecting um, ESD protection device you need to care uh, also about the signal integrity and how, um, yeah, an ESD protection device impacts the signal integrity. 
um, there might be yeah three parameters uh, when uh, which which uh, which are important here. And the first one is for sure the device capacitance. Yeah, so device capacitance is probably the the most important one, and uh, so. Um, but also the routing of how you route to the ESD protection and from the ESD protection device, it's it's very important because uh, you might yeah damage your <laughs> no damage is the, the, the wrong word you, you, yeah you you may in, uh, might inter introduce some discontinuities just by routing and and to to uh, yeah have some problems after that and then not only the signal trigger but also in AMC you, know, you need to follow really strictly the um, yeah routing uh, rules here to to have this 100 ohm let's say for for differential uh, or 50 ohm for for signal and ended but not, not only routing uh, for sure also the package itself in, yeah, impacts um, the signal integrity because of all this prosthetics which what we have in the packets in the package and uh, we will shortly talk about it later on in, in on one of the last slides uh, but today we we will mostly focus on this device capacitance capacit because uh, our experience is that um, this is, yeah, let's say the major uh, parameter for when, when we talk about signal integrity. Those two are for sure also very important and we need to care, but due to time and importance, we want to focus on the device capacitance here. And when we talk about device capacitance, is that is, and, is, is, and, and we, we look at this map, and to here we have, let's say, the most um, automotive buses, yeah, starting from, from Lynn, as Lucas said, yeah, the, yeah, the very, very low speed, 20 kilobits per second. Here, the device capacitance is, is uh, accepted to be up in, in the range of 100 pico farad. Yeah, so when we then in, increase the data rate here, so and go to CAN, CANFD, and, and CANXL, so then the, the device capacitance uh, needs to be much lower, so in the range of 10 or lower than 10, and open alliance, uh, so Ethernet, so we, here we are in the range of 1, 2, or 3 picofarads only, and we will then really go to those high-speed applications, so video links and, and infotainment. Um, so then here we are below one picofarad already, and uh, so for specifically for video links, we really, tar really target uh, yeah below 0.5 uh, uh, even here. And uh, just to give you an idea how the, yeah, the device capacitance impact the, the skater parameters or yeah, signal integrity and one of the, the parameters you can, you can look at the skatering parameters. So, and here I uh, just plotted four different values of device capacitance 0.2 to 1.5 and you see here in this insertion loss. So uh, that yeah, by, up to six gigahertz here. So if if you have here 0.5 and, 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 and or even one picofarad, you will lose uh, at six gigahertz. You will lose uh, three dB here or or more. Yeah. So it's really yeah. Let's say uh, important to have small capacitance. But the good news is is that you if you really have very small capacitance, let's say below 0.5. Uh, you will, uh, in, in search and loss, you will really have yeah, very, very small uh, losses. So only, uh, only a small loss, uh, it's, it's around one, one dB you're losing here at six gigahertz. And similar picture you can see here on, on the return loss. And uh, so, um, if you if you take take one of the high speed ESD protection devices, and the, here we just just an example, we we have chosen one of our, uh, ours, let's say, and this has a capacitance of uh, device capacitance of 0.27 picofarad, typical value, and uh, I just compared uh, this. 
uh, yeah, 0.27 picofarad is simulated with a real measured skater parameters from, from, from real device, let's say. And so if you compare those, you will see that, yeah, they're, they're really, yeah, not deviate very much from it, each other. This is, uh, yeah, let's say good news from two, well, because, because you, if you do not have a scattering process you want to simulate you, your um, the, the signal integrity and uh, the impact of the EC protection device and signal, sig signal integrity, you can just take, um, take the capacitors, cap cap one capacitor with the um, typical value the, from the data sheet and you, uh, let's say, uh, we'll, we'll, you will have a good start with this, yeah. Um, and um, for sure, uh, only if you really have a good, um, yeah, and, and very compact high-speed package, uh, which is which is here. So this is a yeah leadless leadless package with very less parasitic. So and you will um, yeah have a good start and can really make uh, yeah first simulations. Uh, yeah, based uh, based on this typical or on, on on the capacitors capacitance value from the from the data sheet. But what we want to do here, uh, we want to simulate uh, to uh, a high speed link in order to get an impression, get an idea how much is the impact of the ESD protection device on the entire link. Yeah, and uh, we have uh, chosen here, yeah. We will simulate the, the whole link from the uh, transceiver or serializer um, uh, up to the receiver or deserializer. And we'll do this in, in three steps, let's say. We'll first uh, make the yeah. simulation of only one yeah, part here. And um, so one, one, one system PCB. And then we will include, um, make, a, make it more, Realistic by including the cable, which I've chosen this uh, shielded parallel pair cable here, and uh, then we will add also the connector. Okay, uh, let's start with with the simulation of system PCB, and uh, so um, I did it here in in ADS, and uh, I've. I used yeah lossy microsupplies and one at home and um, yeah I've chosen a uh, FR core uh, substrate here with also lossy uh, factor and uh, so I've chosen microsupplies uh, let's say with, but typical length so the entire link is here I think five five cent centimeters roughly so also included the uh, DC capacitors and uh, for sure the um, uh, measured um, scattering parameters from from the ESD protection device we have seen on on the previous slide, and um, so just make it just to make it very simple. Let's say I um, excluded in this simulation the connector, but just place the, the port one and own ports, the differential port here, and also we in in the IC itself and the receiver. I just uh, add uh, put uh, the port and uh, so no internal termination, nothing because those values are always uh, let's say <laughs> deviating from one uh, IC to the other. So just make it very simple. Port uh, one here, the connector. Port two here at the in the IC, and uh, yeah, two scenarios with and without ESD protection device. And here you see the comparison in insertion loss and, and return loss. And so you see here clearly that in uh, yeah, insertion loss, you have a deviation here or the difference of about 0.6 dB here at, at the maximum uh, six gigahertz. And uh, so you have even seven dB here uh, when you look at the return loss. Um, at 2.6 gigahertz, I've chosen this frequency because here we have the maximum. You know, here it's a little less, so the maximum deviation, uh, the, the worst case, let's say, it's here uh, at 2.6 uh, gigahertz and, and 7 dB. 
So, but uh, as we said, this is a very simplified simulation, very simplified scenario, uh, kind of ideal system only. Uh, so without connect connector, cable, no terminations, nothing. Um, and we, in, in the next step, we will, um, yeah, put put uh, put more reality in it. So this is what um, we have seen in the previous slide. So only this one system PCB simulation of one system PCB and uh, in the second step as we said we will add a cable so this SPP cable uh, I've we, we, we put here real uh, so scattering parameters measured scattering parameters for a real cable typical uh, typical SPP cable so and, and and when you measure the whole link so from transceiver to receiver you will get similar picture as, 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 as here so we um, yeah see more reflections here uh, which um, yeah are caused by by this long cable uh, and then this and a mismatch between uh, the, the cable and the uh, and the micro supplies and then or system PCB uh, and uh, if when we add the connector to the whole simulation or two connectors at, at, at both system PCBs, we see the following picture. So <clears throat> I've added here a connector around one, 120 ohm. Uh, so in reality, uh, you you know there. So there one they, they can be uh, even worse. So I have seen connectors. Um, with uh, yeah 60 ohm but also 150 ohm so there is a wide range and it's highly dependent on on the pcb stack and also on the on how you route those connector pins to and and, and traces how what what is the size of your anti-pad and 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 um of the signal pins and and everything so this is, here's a really really wide range on how to make it uh, wrong let's say yeah uh, for the connector and um, um, also for it's very very difficult to to get a really constant impedance over uh, over wide frequency range for the connector so i made it very simple here one on 20 ohm not to worse but not not the best uh, but kind of kind of realistic and um, then again with and without ESD protection device with cable so you see here for sure there's a difference in the insertion loss so that's uh, yeah um, one or, or two db here maximum uh, the difference uh, but and, and, and also in the return loss you see uh, here and there differences but there are some frequency ranges where uh, with and without ESD protection uh, is, is is better. So, and if you follow this, the the whole the whole uh, reality scale, let's say from very simple uh, setup on the left side, yeah, only one system is to be uh, kind of very ideal to to this, yeah, where we put more and more reality. So then you see that um, the impact or the contribution of the ESD protection device on the signal integrity in this. Uh, on, on the skater parameters uh, are um, probably not 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 dominant yeah so there are other factors like cable connector and then the pcb itself which might impact or which it impacts much much more here the 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 entire link um, signal integrity and so um, so but uh, we need to still to be care um or take care about this because we uh, as we said previously this is only valid when you really ch choose a you know, a modern compact device with uh, compact small package um leadless package would be the best because uh, yeah very very less parasitics and also uh, the most important is the device should have really 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 small device capacitors so we recommend here as we said below 0.5 for video links those video links go in the frequency range and the data rate uh, up to up to 12 or 13 gigabit per second right now so even 16 in the next years uh, and we so uh, here you really need to care about uh, 
what is the protection device you choose. But again, if you choose a, a modern SD protection device, to uh, it, it will not impact. Uh, it will not be dominant in the in the signal integrity. For if you look at the at the whole link, which is for sure at the end the most important. Okay, that was the scheduling parameters. Also, one uh, picture or one uh, slide uh, for eye diagram measurements, and here also a small comparison with um, yeah with and without ESD protection device. Um, uh, yeah, those this ESD protection device has a capacitance, capacitance so device capacitance all points. Uh, one seven picofarad, and uh, again here we for sure see a see a small difference, yeah, between without and with, uh, but this this difference uh, is yeah ac acceptable. Um, uh, I think this for HDMI interface um, here. So and it's also yeah very compact and very small capacitance device. Okay, this uh, was the let's say the major part of the of the presentation and the, the signal uh, integrity. Uh, but here we have also some package aspects, as, as I show as, as said previously. Uh, only very shortly, how the package is really or can really impact the signal integrity. And this is a comparison based on this piece can, or our uh, KNFD. Uh, devices we have them um, yeah with a device capacitance of 5.2 picofarad and we have them in, in in two different packages yeah the one is the SOT23 which is very established since 60 and 70 70 years or something um, so very very good and reliable package um, uh, and we have this also in a yeah DFN leadless very compact um, Compact package, and we if you if you place this in a really yeah, simple um, yeah, PCB and you compare and measure uh, scheduling parameters, you will see that uh, here in special and insertion loss, the difference between those pa both packages are around uh, yeah three or four hundred megahertz here, and uh, yeah you have. Again, the same die in both packages, yeah, the same die. So the uh, device capacitance is, let's say, uh, the same or very similar. But the, what 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 makes the difference here is really the the, the package and 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 leads, let's say, from the SOT23 package. So with the parasitic inductance and also the capacitances here. Uh, to the to the chip in, inside, um, you know, making really the difference here. And uh, so, although the those those packages this package is really reliable established, but if you really think about uh, high speed applications, you you need to to look on on other more compact and more uh, yeah, more high speed packages. Let's say. And another, uh, just very, very shortly, uh, the package not only impacts the signal integrity, but also also the clamping behavior. And uh, why is this so? Um, if you yeah, consider such a very yeah, uh, simplified um, block diagram on the right side, you have the, the, the IC and we have the traces with some parasitics, but we also have this ESD protection device. And the, the, this ESD protection device has this turn on uh, part, let's say, the dynamic resistance, but it also has this um, yeah, parasitic conductance, yeah, which is, yeah. In, in, or, or is yeah in in the for example in the in the leads, uh, so this parasitic inductance can be small or 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 or, or, uh, or very high, uh, but the higher the parasitic inductance is, the 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 more you will see, uh, uh, yeah, the voltage uh, overshoot uh, at the very beginning of your ESD pulse because uh, we have very short rise time here Lucas thought about yeah, smaller than one nanosecond so this is uh, for sure yeah yeah very very fast and those parasitic inductance here will uh, yeah prevent the uh, the uh, ST protection device for 
uh, for pre prevent protecting and uh, and uh, yeah uh, causing this overshoot which for sure then your IC will also see and uh, for those of the other IC it can be also critical here especially for those very sophisticated and, and complex high-speed ICs. Okay, so the package is also impacting the the uh, the clamping behavior, the ESD behavior, not only the signal integrity. Okay, so this was is so yeah. Uh, one word to to how you can really simulate uh, ESD uh, events, and here we have the system efficient ESD design, and this is a very yeah, yeah, useful method to really simulate ESD on um, on circuit level, let's say. So you can do it, um, yeah, just before having even having a PCB or even having a layout, just just based on on your circuit uh, circuit diagram, and uh, uh, those seed simulations help you to uh, to to simulate this uh, ESD event and also to uh, yeah, look on the voltages and current which are going here into the phi in order to investigate what will really be the stress uh, for your for your phi, for your SC. And this is one of the examples, one of the results uh, we, we, we gained from such seed simulations. Yeah, this is the, the current which is going into the phi uh, during an ESD event. And uh, so here is simulation and measurement and um, compared and you see for sure there are some deviations, but we also have really good, in general, the shape is in, in, in good alignment. And so we are working here strongly on, on those seed simulations. So, and if you are interested in, in those, uh, in this method, so just reach out to us and uh, we are looking, always looking for partners in this field here. Okay, so um, let's conclude my talk shortly. We have seen that um, ESD can, yeah, uh, is an uh, irreversible destruction to your system or can be, uh, can damage, uh, can, can, can make a malfunction and really damage your system. So and if you're looking for an external ESD protection, you really need to, uh, take care of your of your specifics of each of the bus we we have talked. So link can Ethernet or or um, uh, video link. So all of these buses are very specific, and you need to take care about those specifics. So there's no one ESD protection device for everything. So there's uh, yeah um, for each bus a specific uh, device there. So um, yeah, we have we talk about signal integrity a lot, uh, especially for this video links, high speed links, and um, so here the SD protection device for sure impact the signal integrity. But if you if you choose a really compact and small capacitance one, then you uh, so the impact is of, of yeah of minor, uh, is, and it's not dominating the whole <coughs> signal integrity here. Okay, so, uh, and uh, this is uh, the last slide of our presentation today. So <clears throat> in this, uh, yeah, one hour roughly. <laughs> so we, we presented to you uh, some, some parts of, of, uh, of, yeah, of our ESD, uh, uh, let's say um, documentation. We, you can you can find even even more with much more details and much more examples in in our hand, handbooks. We have a <clears throat> general ESD application handbook, but we have also an automotive edition since July last year. So it's kind of kind of new, uh, and there are much uh, even more examples also uh, for uh, yeah. For, yeah, for for the whole for all buses uh, for all automotive buses and also a lot of fundamentals are covered and measurement meso methods are covered uh, in, in more detail there um, yeah if you look a specific product you can look in our yeah 
selection guide, not only uh, UC protection device, but also other discrete components, MOSFETs and, and logic parts uh, you, can, you can find there. And uh, yeah, we have a dedicated lab in, in Hamburg. So with uh, some ESD testing for sure, but we also have this GSP, TLP transmission line poles, which we very, very often use. EMI, EMI scan seed simulations and for sure our RF, so high speed equipment uh, with VNA and TDR. Uh, so we are using for analysis of our devices, but we also can use for sure uh, for collaboration purposes. Okay, that uh, that's it. And yeah, thank you. And thank you for, for, for being with us. And uh, yeah, if you have some questions, we would uh, yeah, like to have a discussion with you for sure. So uh, thank you, Andreas and Lucas for the presentation. We In the chat window, there is, um, I don't know if you guys can see that. Also, I sent out a couple of chats to people I couldn't decipher your uh, names. So if you please look in the chat window, and respond to me, I'd appreciate it. So the, the comment and question from the chat window is the networks of the USB, HDMI and such coming from consumer are present. In the past, we've had these in systems for consumer inputs, phones and data drives from the customer. Um, they're not for a data network in the vehicle. This customer use is short and input to a module infotainment. Past efforts for the IEEE 1934 Firewire was discussed for the automotive, did not have any success. The Ethernet was tried, but has had some use with the BMW, but the open consortium had a real use of the new two-wire standard. Question is, does USB HDMI have use for just customer to infotainment or more to the networks. Um, then it says most in FlexRay also from the past limited use and FlexRay may have had a few uses, but can FD and open ethernet have arrived? Oh yeah, very, very broad question. Very good questions. Um, so um, we uh, thought also that, that, that uh, for example, FlexRay, yeah, we, let's talk about, start with FlexRay. FlexRay was uh, kind of very calmer on FlexRay in the last years, but in, 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 in last month, uh, let's say, there are really some uh, yeah, uh, more uh, questions rising to us. Uh, about about FlexRay and here and there and there we are really receiving more requests for for this. Yeah, we're not really in, in we have not the, the big picture why uh, it was so calm in earlier one and, and now it's it's increasing. Uh, we will find out in, in, in let's say in the future. But so FlexRay is really not uh, not that I'd say. So it's 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 still there and we really. Have discussions with our customers about about uh, yeah future flexor applications so it's really there okay so yeah for uh, usb and and hdmi so it's really not a uh, so what where we faced uh, or faced those uh, protocols is really in the inf infotainment yeah it's uh, so it's not a real big let's say uh, network as it's uh, as it's either net or something so either it's really became or yeah being a, a backbone right now in in, whole, in this whole uh, car architecture. So it's it's become become very very important. But USB and and HDMI is really what we see in, in yeah so in in, in more and more in, in in this in infotainment area and yeah not really used as a as a big network. Okay, does it hey, answer do, some somehow this question? That's fine. Um, does anyone else have a question? You can open your microphone up and ask it at this time. Uh, we recorded this entire meeting and it'll be available soon, as soon as I can get it up on the website and I'll send a, a, another email follow-up. And also um, I'm supposed to get the slides from the meeting and those will be available as well. So before the contest, 
Um, I have a letter actually written by our awards chairman, um, Jim Woodyard. So, uh, dear Andreas and Lucas, on behalf of the Southeastern Michigan IEEE EMC Society, I wish to express appreciation for your presentation to our chapter on April the 15th, 2021, entitled ESD Protection for Automotive Interfaces. Our chapter has recognized your professional commitment to the education of our members with a speaker award, which includes a donation in your names to the IEEE, IEEE EMC Society President's Memorial Scholarship Fund. Your name, the topic, presentation, donation may be viewed at the chapter's speaker awards list on our website, along with a complete list of our awards that we've given out since 2012. And I'll be emailing you an electronic copy of this award letter soon. Oh, Thank you very thanks. Much. thanks a lot. <laughs> very, very cool. Yeah. yeah. You're Thank welcome. You. Okay, so um, I, I have the roster in front of me here and uh, I use the Google random number generator and it generates a random number and then uh, I line that up to the uh, number of the person on the roster, which happens to be in alphabetical order by last name. So uh, random number uh, first drawing goes to number 20, which is Malcolm Lund. Malcolm, are you still on the line? Yes, Scott, I'm here. Okay, excellent. So you are the first winner. The second number drawn is number 14, Louis Hernandez. Louis, are you on are you on the line tonight? Going once, going twice. Third name drawn tonight was uh, Kunal Singh, K-U-N-A-L Singh. Are you on the line tonight with us? Going once, going twice. Okay, the next one drawn uh, was number two, E. Avilia, A-V-I-L-A. -A. Hi, Scott. Yes, I am on. Excellent. Okay, so you get the second $50 gift card. The next one, number five, is uh, Jim Muccioli. I'm on the line, Scott. Excellent, Jim. Okay, that's uh, three. So congratulations, everyone. And I will send uh, the contact information to Jim Har Hargenrader. Jim, are you on the line tonight? No, that's a fine. I, I will uh, send those over to Jim. And let's see, where are we now? I think, I think that is about it. So um, thank you everybody for uh, stopping by this evening and we'll see you next time. Thanks a lot. Thank you very thank, much. Thanks everyone. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye now. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.